Hey folks, Arm and Hammer here, and guess what finally came out? The official rule book! Yay! So we've been waiting for the official 2019 games rule book for a very long time because if you have been living under a rock, the 2019 CrossFit game season absolutely has just blown up everything that we've been doing in the past and has created a whole new set of qualifying procedures. And after reading this rule book, I've taken seven pages of handwritten notes and there are 21 new sections on this rule book. So there's a whole lot that's changed, which means this is going to be a bit of a long video. Now, do not worry, you can go into the description and find time codes for the various sections that we're gonna be talking about. Hopefully that gives you a better idea of, you know, maybe the things that more particularly pertain to you. Maybe you're wondering what's going on with the teens and the masters and how are the how's the score changing from this year versus the last couple years or maybe you're wondering about the prize money how much money is Matt Fraser going to win this year for winning the CrossFit Games versus previous years for winning the CrossFit Games those are all very important questions and like I said there's a lot of changes we're gonna dive into every single one of them in this video and in the description you can find exactly the timestamp you need to go to in order to find the information that is pertinent to you now let's get started Let's start with the Open. Now we've known the Open dates for a while now, February 21st to March 25th. And the format of the Open is not gonna be changing. It's gonna be five weeks. Workouts are gonna be released Thursdays at 5 p.m. Pacific, and you have until that Monday at 5 p.m. Pacific to submit your scores. The divisions are all the same, the same teenage divisions we've gotten used to, the same master's divisions we've gotten used to. But one thing that people have been asking about constantly is how do you decide the national champion? So now we know that the nationality requirement is based off of citizenship, not residency. And that is a big change because residency has been used on the team side of things for years now. So residency now has nothing to do with this requirement. National champions do not need to live in the country that they're representing, they just need to be citizens of the country that they're representing. And when you register for the 2019 Open, you're going to register with your nationality, with your citizenship. And if you have dual citizenship, you can actually pick which country you want to represent, but you can only represent one, and once you pick, you're locked in for the 2019 game season. Now, speaking of national champions, this is one of the, and probably the biggest way that people are gonna be qualifying for the CrossFit Games. However, in order to earn that spot, to get that qualification, the national champion needs to have done every single open workout as prescribed and if they do not do every single open workout as prescribed and yet somehow end up being the national champion their spot is not going to go to the next best person who did every workout as prescribed that is that that to me sounds like a little bit of like a strange scenario but that's a very specific thing to understand that the best crossfitter who can do all five workouts as prescribed and be the national champion in their country is the person that's going to be getting the invite. This doesn't really apply to larger or better developed CrossFit you know, presence nations. It is going to apply though, I think, to some of the smaller or newer CrossFit affiliates in, in smaller countries that haven't been around for a long time and don't have that population. Now, one of, the, one of the more interesting new specifications here is something I think that maybe has been happening in the past and definitely should not have been, but now it's explicitly in the rule book that affiliate managers cannot validate scores that did not physically take place in their affiliate. I don't know why that has to be written out. I'm not sure what situations that was being broken in, but I guess it's uh, it's really necessary to have that in writing. I, again, I can't figure out exactly what scenario that would be uh, happening in where it's okay, but either way, uh, affiliate managers, you cannot validate scores that did not take place inside of your physical location. Also, the video review process is now gonna encompass the top five of every country and the top 40 worldwide. So that is a whole lot of videos that athletes are going to be asked to submit. And I hope their video re review process is you know, robust. Uh, I hope they have enough volunteers or people they're paying, hopefully, to, to do this process because that's gonna be a lot of videos. And like years past, athletes can either provide the original video of 
the workout or workouts that CrossFit requests, or they can have that weekend to redo those workouts and submit the new video. All right, let's talk the age groups because this is uh, this is really cool. There's some changes here that I think that are massive and very, very important and very positive actually. So the age group online qualifier will continue to exist. The top 200 from each division in the masters and the teens are going to be qualified for the age group online qualifier. Now here's where things are different. In previous years, your open standing was your first score in the age group online qualifier. And now that's completely gone, which means that everyone starts back on a clean slate when the age group online qualifier kicks off. The age group online qualifier is gonna kick off Thursday, May 2nd, 5 p.m. Pacific. The workouts are gonna be announced. Athletes are gonna have until Monday, May 6th, 5 p.m. Pacific to submit all their scores. Every single workout needs to be filmed and every workout needs to have a registered judge. And at the end of this process, where remember they reset the scores so the open doesn't count for your qualification to the games anymore for the masters and the teens, at the end of the process, they're only going to take the top 10 from each division. So now they're taking less athletes to the CrossFit Games, which is something that I've talked about in the past where I think they're gonna try and treat the masters and the teens a, a little bit more like the halftime show in between the heats of the individuals and the teams at the CrossFit Games. So maybe putting them more onto the main fields and less sequestered into like their own little barn. And if a member of the top 10 in a division declines their spot, they'll they'll keep going down the line and take the next highest qualifier. So it's, it's gonna backfill and it's always gonna be 10 athletes. All right, let's talk sanctionals. Now the sanctionals are really explicitly written into the rules as not a part of the CrossFit game season. And I think the reason why they do that is so that they can really clarify that the CrossFit games open, the age group online qualifier, and the CrossFit Games themselves are the three events that CrossFit Incorporated runs and controls as part of the game season. That the sanctionals are outside entities running their own events with their own rules, their own registration, their own qualification. It's all completely up to them. And that those events are sanctioned and licensed to get spots to the CrossFit Games. Now, it's a really interesting distinction. It's probably a small distinction, but I thought that was a really you know, fascinating little tidbit that they decided to specifically lay out there. One of the most common questions that people have about sanctionals is what happens if someone wins more than one? And we now have an answer to that. The answer is the second place finisher of the most recent sanctional that that event, that that athlete won is who qualifies for the CrossFit Games. So for example, Matt Fraser wins Dubai. Let's say Matt Fraser goes to the Rogue Invitational and wins that event as well. Instead of second place at Dubai getting the invite, it's gonna be second place at the Rogue Invitational who gets the invite. And if Matt goes to yet another sanctional between the Rogue Invitational and the CrossFit Games, instead of the second place person at Rogue Invitational getting the invite, it's gonna be the second place person at whatever that third event is. So it, they use the most recent event that the multi-time winner wins that second place. It sounds more complicated than it actually is. It makes sense when you think about it in terms of whatever event is the closest in terms of chronological time to the CrossFit Games, that's the event that, the set, that they're gonna backfill the spot from. Another interesting fact about the sanctionals is that because they're the only way that a team can qualify for the Games, no team member and no winner of a sanctional really needs to do the CrossFit Games Open. Now, that's a very specific word, right? You don't need to do the CrossFit Games Open. However, let's talk a little bit about how the games have changed and the qualification process as well as the seeding process has changed. Now, the CrossFit Games seeding process is going to use the 2019 Open as the seeding ranking. So if you don't do the 2019 Open, you're actually going to be seeded below everyone who did do the 20, 2019 Open, which means that while you don't have to do it, you sure as hell want to do it because having a good seeding going into a series of elimination workouts is absolutely necessary if you plan on doing well. So looking at games qualification, we have win a sanctional and you're in, win your nation and your win, so national championship, and then top 20 worldwide in the open. Now, we talked a little bit about sanctionals and how it works if you win multiple sanctionals, but if you are a national champion and you decline your spot, 
it will not be backfilled to second place. So the only way that you can guarantee getting a spot to the CrossFit Games is to win a sanctional or to win a national championship and be the best CrossFitter in your nation. If you're in second place and the person in first place cannot go to the CrossFit Games and says no, you're not going to get that invite. Now looking at the top 20 in the worldwide open, that's a slightly different matter. If in that top 20, one of the athletes goes onto a team or is a national champion, those spots are going to be backfilled. So they're gonna take 21st or 22nd or whatever. If one of those athletes wins a sanctional event, their spot is not going to be backfilled. That's a really important distinction because what you're saying here is, for example, we know that there's a CrossFit Games team built out of the Invictus people. It's Lauren Fisher, it's Rasmus Anderson, it's Reagan Huckabee, it's Tommy Venus. Let's say Rasmus Anderson has a fantastic 2019 CrossFit Games Open, places like 15th in the world. That's really solid, but he has a team spot. So because of that, they're gonna take 21st as well because he's not gonna take that individual spot. So that's a whole lot about the age groups and the individuals, but let's talk a little bit about the teams because the teams are a really big change from the previous years. We have super teams, the only way to qualify is to win a sanctional, and once you win a sanctional with a team, your team is going to declare two alternates. So then you have a six person roster, and once you get to the CrossFit Games, you can actually field any of those six people, you know, two men, two women, any combination they're in to have a four person team, it doesn't matter whether they were some of the original people that qualified or if they're the alternates, but you only get those six to choose from. And if one of them decides to go indie, qualifies individually and decides to go indie, you can still only pick from the six people on that roster. And if more than one female and one male decide to go indie, you're boned. Your team is out. You're, you're not going to the CrossFit Games and it's actually unclear whether they're going to backfill that spot. And my guess is they're probably not going to backfill that spot. Now, ideally, and what's going to happen in the future for the 2020 season and on, the team roster is going to be declared within a week of the qualification from the sanctional that they win. So, down the line, for example, let's say Dubai 2019, the team that wins that event, they're gonna declare their roster a week after they've won that event. This year, because there have been events and there will be several events that happen before the Open is wrapped, team rosters are gonna be declared after the 2019 Games Open is over. All right, let's take a look at the prize money. Now, we've seen some things change and some things stay the same. The, the first place finisher is still gonna get $300,000. That's on the men's side and the women's side. The second place finisher is gonna get $115,000, which is a $15,000 increase from 2018. Now, third place is still the same. That's $75,000. Fourth place is the same. That's still $50,000. In fact, fifth place through 12th place, that's all still the same. None of that has changed from 2018. From that point on, 13th through the 20th, each of those spots got, got a $1,000 increase to their prize pool. So we're seeing a little bit more money filtering down to the middle of the pack, which I think is pretty important to see, especially considering we don't really know exactly how many people are gonna be making it through these cuts. Who knows, like we may not even see spots 13 through 20 compete for more than a couple of events before it cuts down to say like the top 10 or the top 12. And those are the athletes that compete for the majority over the course of the weekend. On the team side of things, we actually have a pretty positive increase. We have, we have still $100,000 available for the first place finishers, but second place, they have $10,000 more. They have $70,000 now in prize money. Third place, they have $40,000 in prize money. That's $10,000 more. And then fourth and fifth place, they each get a $5,000 bump from 20 to 25,000 and to 20,000. All right, so lastly, I'm gonna touch briefly on the new transgender policy. And I'm gonna touch briefly on it because honestly, I don't really know enough about this to give you sort of like an in-depth review or an out analysis here, right? But what I do see is it seems that CrossFit is following the footsteps of some other Olympic sports in how it's defining what is okay and what isn't. Now, every athlete is gonna pick their gender or declare their gender when they register for the Open. You can declare the gender that matches your birth certificate or not, but if you declare a gender that doesn't match your birth certificate, you're, you're basically saying to CrossFit that, quote, you have civil documents that reflect this and also that you live that gender in your everyday life. Now, I don't know exactly what that means or how you prove that, 
but that's CrossFit's policy. Now, transgender males basically get, uh, you know, they get to declare that they're a male and then they compete as a male and there really aren't any other stipulations past that. Where we see a whole lot of rules and where we see athletes who are going to be tested similar to what we have seen in Olympic sports is on the transgender female side of things. Now, trans females must declare that they are a trans female to CrossFit before the age group online qualifier and before the CrossFit Games, and they cannot change that declaration for a minimum of four years uh, outside of, I guess, some very specific purposes. They don't really talk about what that means. Um, but they also say that those athletes need to prove that for 12 months leading up to the CrossFit Games season, they had a testosterone level in their body's blood serum that is below 10 nanomoles per liter. I think this is a common number. It's used in a few other sports. I think we've seen it used in track and field um, as well as weightlifting. Now, I don't know exactly how this process works. I don't know if it's the same testing that goes into uh, drug testing, but um, you know, I'm still, like I said, reading into this. Uh, if someone knows more about this than I do, I'm more than happy to uh, you know, talk to you and learn to figure out exactly what's going on. So if you do have any information on this that could help elucidate some of this and maybe maybe shine some light on, on these dark corners, I'm, I'm, I'm all ears. So hit me up and let me know what's going on here. So there you have it, folks. That is the 2019 CrossFit Games rulebook, just a, an overview of some of the big changes. Remember, you can read the full rulebook in the description below. I have, I have the link in there. I, I suggest checking it out if you're interested. It's kind of dry, but there's some interesting stuff in there. Remember, folks, there's a whole lot going on in our space, and it's easy to miss some of the most interesting and exciting stories. That is what I'm here for, and I'll see you guys next time. But before I go, I just want to say thank you so much to everybody for watching this. Thank you so much for supporting this. I really appreciate it. I hope you guys enjoy this as much as I enjoyed doing it. Please like, follow, subscribe, share it with your friends. If you have anything you specifically want me to talk about, let me know. I'm all ears. Hope you guys have a good one, and I'll see you guys next time.